Welcome to the Renaissance and welcome to this edition of The Effect or Impact of Ignorance on Negroes, Part 2. Important Notice It is not our intention to offend anyone with this video. The goal of this video is for you to look for the materials referenced and study them yourself. Remember, no matter how bitter the truth might be, it is still the truth. To our so-called African-American brothers and sisters, we do not call you out because we do not love you. We are not apportioning blames but trying to wake all of us up. Please do not misconstrue this work. We cannot speak or behave like you because the enemy has separated us. We are your brothers first before any other group. Remember, not all Africans are Negroes. In this edition, we shall still be looking at the visible cases of ignorance and again, we shall be referencing the statement by a Florida state rep, Kimberly Daniels, where she said, I thank God for slavery. If it wasn't for slavery, I might be somewhere in Africa worshipping a tree. So we shall be exposing the horrors of the slave trade and subsequently we shall establish who between herself and the Negroes or Africans who actually is worshipping or worships a tree. Let us start by asking, does she know how the slaves were acquired? Does she know the fatality rate between raid, capture, yoke and transportation of the Negroes to anywhere? Does she know why many right-thinking people fought to end the slave trade? Does she know what it means to burn down people's houses and killing the old and sick? Does she know how many Negroes survived the voyage? Does she know she is actually the one worshipping a tree and not the Africans, let alone the Negroes? So, if we reference a book called A Geographical Survey of Africa, its rivers, lakes, mountains, production states, populations, etc., with a map on an entirely new construction written by James McQueen, Esquire, and published in 1840, we see the following account. About sunset, we halted near a well within half a mile of Mishro. Round this spot were lying more than 100 skeletons, some of them with the skin still remaining attached to the bones, not even a little sand thrown over them. The Arabs laughed heartily at my expression of horror and said they were only blacks. Nambo damned their fathers and began knocking about the limbs with the butt end of their firelocks, saying, This was a woman, this was a youngster, and such like unfeeling expressions. The greater part of the unhappy people, of whom these were the remains, had formed the spoils of the Sultan of Fezan the year before. I was assured that they had left Bonu with not above a quarter's allowance for each and that more died from want than fatigue. They were matched off with chains round their necks and legs. The most robust only arrived in Fezan in a very debilitated state and were there fattened for the Tripoli slave market. Our camels did not come up until it was quite dark and we bivouacked in the midst of those unearthed remains of the victims of persecution and avarice after a long day's journey of 26 miles, in the course of which one of our party counted 107 of these skeletons. Then Hans Travels, page 9 and 10. So we see what a so-called pastor is thanking God for, and we still wonder which God she is thanking for the faith of these people over 100 skeletons these are those that they were counted and you see someone today saying she thanks god for it if she was there could she have survived that journey the answer is no she is thanking her god because of her pocket because of avarice because of um, greed because of the love for money otherwise there is no reason anybody can be thanking god for an experience such as this you probably noticed that the book we cited referenced another book written by Denham, 
so we thought it wise to go to the source to be sure that they reported exactly what the author wrote. And then if we reference a book called A Narrative of Travels and Discoveries in Northern and Central Africa in the years 1822, 1823 and 1824 by Major Denham, Captain Clapperton and the late Dr. Odney and it was published in 1826, we see the following account to corroborate what we cited in the other book. About sunset, we halted near a well within a half a mile of Mishro. Round this spot we are lying more than 100 skeletons, some of them with the skin still remaining attached to the bones, not even a little sand thrown over them. The Arabs laughed heartily at my expression of horror and said they were only blacks. Nambo damned their fathers and began knocking about the limbs with the butt end of their fire locks saying this was a woman, this was a youngster and such like unfeeling expressions. The greater part of the unhappy people of whom these were the remains had formed the spoils of the Sultan of Fezan the year before. I was assured that they had left Bruno with not above a quarter's allowance for each and that more died from want than fatigue. They were matched off with chains round their necks and legs and most robust only arrived in Fezan in a very debilitated state and were there fattened for the triple slave market. So you see what someone, a human being is thanking God for an experience as horrendous as this. Remember, it is the same people that brought the Islam they claim that is true today. So you understand what they are playing at. All these are the things that are meant to inyoke you mentally. So you believe there is some salvation coming from them. You see the same people, the same group, they just rebranded it, re-strategized and here we are today. On the other side of the page, we see where it tells us that one of the skeletons we passed today had a very fresh appearance. The beard was still hanging on the skin of the face and the features were still discernible. A merchant traveling with the kafila suddenly exclaimed, that was my slave. I left him behind four months ago near this spot. Make haste, take him to that fizzog, that's market, said an Arab wag for fear anybody else should claim him. We had no water and the most fatiguing day. So you see um, what someone is thanking God for. Remember, if this uh, Kimberly was there that time, she probably would have either died or would have been one of the skeletons we're seeing today or we're reading about today. The reason she is saying what she's saying is that she has no understanding of what the slave trade was all about. She thought it was just people would blink from wherever they were and then appear in the US or in Europe to be slaves. And she thinks that it wouldn't have been better that the people were worshipping trees than going through these horrible experiences. Again, if we reference another book called The Slavery of Today or The Present Position of the Open Saw of Africa by Charles A. Swan, we see the following account. So we see where it tells us that all feeling against the Portuguese as such must be put aside for the struggle which right-minded people are making on behalf of the helpless and downtrodden African. It is not against the Portuguese but against the unjust system of depriving men and women of their rights as human beings and using them as we use animals for our own convenience or pecuniary ends without for a moment taking into consideration their will or inclinations. It is not a question of whether they are treated well or not, for the man who treats his horse badly is a fool if he wants to get the greatest possible amount of work out of him. Neither is it a question of whether the black man should be made to work or not, for all will agree that if he will not work, he must be made to do so. So you see that these people are playing God. This is what somebody is thanking God for. And you look on the right, on the other side of the page, you see skeletons of those that died because they just hang, leave them. So this is why you see no matter how many people the Fulanese kill in sub-Saharan Africa today, 
the BBCs, VOA, CNN, Al Jazeera, all of them pretend not to see what's going on. This is just what they are doing. The same thing. The only thing they moved from individual slavery to corporate slavery. So they put them in countries created by them and then they handpick those they want that will be playing by their dictates. That's exactly what is going on. Let us move forward. And remember, this lady is thanking God for these experiences. Perhaps if she was there, she would have been one of these skeletons we are looking at on this page. Let us also reference a book called The Journal of Negro History by Katha G. Whitson, Volume 2, published 1917. We see the following account. It says, The mortality in crossing the desert was frightful. Denham saw near a well in the Tibu country 100 skeletons of Negroes who had perished from hunger and thirst. In his travels, he saw a skeleton every few miles, and for several days, he passed from 60 to 90 skeletons per day. Sometimes a whole caravan perished, consisting of as many as 2,000 persons and 1,800 camels. The Negroes composing the caravans often had to walk and carry heavy loads. Ruff says that if one did not know the route of their pilgrimage, he could find the way by the bones that lie to the right and left of the path. When he was passing through Mozak in 1865, he gave medical aid to a slave dealer who was very ill, and in compensation received a boy about seven or eight years old. The boy had traveled four months across the desert from Lake Chad. He knew nothing of his home country, had even forgotten his mother tongue, and could jabber only some fragments of speech picked up from the other slave, slaves of the caravan. As a result of the long journey, he was emaciated to a skeleton and so enfeebled that he could scarcely stand up. He crawled on all fours and kissed the hand of his new master, and the first words he uttered were, I am hungry. So you see what the Kimberley is, Kimberley or whatever, is thanking God for. This is an experience. This is a near seven or eight year old boy captured in a slave raid. And then she's thanking God for it. How does she know she wouldn't have been one of these skeletons that are seen everywhere? How does she know how, or that she wouldn't have been one of those that died? So does she think that worshipping a three is worse than capturing and selling humans like cattle and things? like that just in case she probably doesn't know and those that are reading like her the reason the negroes got these religions were the fear of slavery these are not their religion their religion worshipped the almighty creator the one you read about in the old testament if you check today there is nothing like manna from heaven because it is not the same god you are worshipping in either your church or mosque or synagogue these are man-made ones so let us move forward so from the same book we see here that but suddenly there was a mighty noise of crying and groaning of calling at each other and bidding farewell to friends some were so overcome at the fear of being eaten that they rode upon the ground and absolutely refused to work nothing could persuade them to get up until a guard came along with his great whip which brought blood at each lash as the great army passed through the gate of the city, an officer of the Sultan examined every slave to be sure none was a Felata, Mohammedan, or Jew. So we can safely say that this Kimberley would have gladly followed the slave caravan, wouldn't have waited for the people to flog her with blood coming out at, with each flogging before she will follow the caravan. Remember, if you notice, they wrote that some were so overcome at the fear of being eaten. That is a very, very subtle way of making it look like the only reason they were afraid of the slavery was the fear of being eaten, instead of the fact that they were actually afraid of slavery. Many Negroes actually killed their families, themselves, their wives and their kids just to avoid being captured as slaves. These are things that this lady obviously does not know about and unfortunately we do not have the luxury of time to show her some of these horrors in this edition. So from the same book, we see where it tells us that the next day, the caravan were obliged to stop in consequence of a Negro woman who gave birth to a child. This stop, however, was not very lengthy. 
In a few hours, she and her infant were placed upon a camel and the caravan went forward. When the camp was pitched for the next night, the leader in making his rounds ordered that the young Negro mother be left unshackled and that she be given some meat for supper and allowed to sleep warmly upon a mat. But during the night, when everything was quiet, the mother put her infant in a basket filled with ostrich feathers, placed it upon her head and made her escape. Next morning, upon discovering her flight, every several bands of men were sent out in different directions to find her. One of these, after a few hours of search, found her in a thicket, nursing her child. She was led back to the camp, and two gunshots recalled the other bands, and the caravan then resumed their march. So this is what this lady is thanking God for, so that you see that because she is ignorant of the horrors of the slave trade, she is thanking God for something as horrendous as this. On the other side of the page, we see something like this. None of our slaves, said Domas, I am sure will ever forget this stop, for it was there that they were for the first time given their liberty after being in irons a month. So this lady is telling us that she would have loved to be in irons for a month and would have loved to go through these horrible trips. She would have loved to die the way those people died with their skeletons littered all over the desert. And she is talking about thanking God for it. Let us reference a book called Remarks on the Slave Trade and the Slavery of the Negroes in a series of letters by Africanos. And it tells us that on the 29th of November, 1781, 54 slaves were thrown alive into the sea from a guinea ship commanded by one Captain Collingwood. On the 30th, 42 more shared the same fate. And in about three days afterwards, 26 more. Ten others who were brought up on deck for the same purpose did not wait to be handcuffed, but bravely leaped into the sea and shared the fate of their companions. It is a fact which came out in evidence in the course of the trial at the court of King's Bench, Guildhall, sometime in March 1783, and the people on board this ship had not been put on short allowance. The excuse which the mate of the ship, who gave the evidence, made for this conduct was that if the slaves who were then sickly had died a natural death, the loss would have been the owners. But as they were thrown alive into the sea, it would fall upon the underwriters. So you see how they used the life of Negroes to claim insurance and all that. So now this is, these are the things this lady is thanking God for because she is ignorant of the truth of the slave trade the granularities of it you can imagine let us also reference a book called africa and the american flag by commander andrew h foot and it was published in 1853 we see the following account in regard to the gallant's voyage 1788 the testimony is some of the deceased were obliged to be kept on deck the slaves, both when ill and well, were frequently forced to eat against their inclination, were whipped with a cart if they refused. The parts on which their shackles are fastened are often excoriated by the violent exercise they are forced to take, and of this they made many grievous complaints to him. So here we see where it tells us that Guinea man when the trade was under systematic regulations, the slaves were obliged to lie on their bags and were shackled by their ankles, the left of one being feathered close to the right of the next, so that the whole number in one line formed a single living chain. When one died, the body remained during the night or during bad weather, secured to the two between whom he was. The height between decks was so little that a man of ordinary size could hardly sit upright. During good weather, a gang of slaves was taken on the spar deck and there remained for a short time. In bad weather, when the hatches were closed, death from suffocation would necessarily occur. It can therefore easily be understood that the athletics strangled the weaker intentionally in order to procure more space and that when striving to get near some aperture 
affording air to breathe. Many would be injured or killed in the struggle. Such were the horrors of the Middle Passage, and such are the things that Kimberley is celebrating and thanking God for today, you can imagine. Again, if we reference a book called Cardinal Lavigery, Primate of Africa adapted from the French, written by Reverend G.J. Bean, and it was published in 1898, we see the following account of the horrors of the slave trade. So it says, Stanley, who may be suspected of neither tenderness nor compassion towards the Negroes, says that 100 Negroes are destroyed in order to procure two slaves. The traders burn the huts, kill the first inhabitants whom they meet, and surround the others, from whom they select only the most profitable. The villages disappear as if they had only existed in the imagination. Father Guleman writes the following letter to the Cardinal. I saw a drove of slaves at Enojiji, long files of men, women and children, some with ropes around their necks, others bound together by a rope which pierced their ear. I met at every step living skeletons who could scarcely walk, even with the aid of a cane. They were not bound because they were no longer able to escape. Suffering and privations were depicted upon their emaciated countenances. The victims were dying rather of hunger than of disease. Gaping scars upon their backs manifested too clearly the cruelty of their masters, who forced them to continue their journey under the sting of the lash. Others lay starving on the streets, awaiting patiently the end of their miserable existence. A young Christian, ignorant of the roads, wished to go to the border of the lake but he recoiled with horror at the sight of the numerous corpses, half devoured by hyenas and birds of prey. He asked an Arab why these corpses were so numerous in the neighborhood of Ujiji. We are accustomed, replied the Arab, indifferently, to cast there the carcass of our slaves. But this year, the number of deaths has been so large that the animals have been gorged with human flesh. Two vessels Threatened with slaves were captured at Zanzibar by the English cruisers. So we see how horrible it was for the Negroes. But here you see someone who has no idea of what the slave trade is all about, talking about thanking God for it. If she had been in one of these caravans, do you think she would have survived? If she had witnessed these horrors, do you think she wouldn't have been one of the first to die? So you see how ignorance makes the Negroes make pronouncements that are rather senseless and we can't even define what they mean in the real sense of it. Let us move forward. Before we round up, let us quickly address one very key issue on ignorance. You may have heard how it is being alleged or claimed that it was Africans that sold other Africans or how it was Negroes that sold themselves. Let us quickly reference a book called Encyclopedia Britannica or a dictionary of arts, sciences, and miscellaneous literature constructed on a plan by which the different sciences and arts are digested into the form of distinct treatises or systems, and it was published in 1853. We see this following account of how the British slave raid happened. Remember, numerous accounts show where the British were the slave raiders and some showed where they were killed during a slave raid. It's important to also note that they were allies of both the Arabs and the Fulanese. So it is their power of propaganda that they have used to turn it around to say Negroes sold themselves. Now think about it. Does it make sense that any man could have sold his son or daughter for nothing? It's impossible. And again, there is no way, let's say, a man that has just a bow of an, an arrow can capture 100 people. And let's assume there are two or three people there like Mike Tyson or Lennox Lowy or some of these um, very strong men. How would they follow them? Before you set your arrow, they, could have, they would have grabbed you and um, killed you or something. So it is impossible. So we just want to show this so that you understand that the British, they lied about it. When they claim that, oh no, it was Africans selling other Africans because they know how to create chaos and then hide behind their allies. 
like it's happening now in places like sub-saharan africa where their fulani allies are killing people but they pretend not to see the same applies to the americans and that's why you don't see the bbc or voa reporting some of the atrocities going on there remember the same way the slave raiding armies were equipped with firearms by the europeans and arabs is the same way they equipped the army which metamorphosed from the slave raiding terror groups at that time to what you have as army today so they still equip them it's still the same thing but rebranded so let us look at this account briefly so here we see john snock mentioned in Bosman when on the coast road they, we cast anchor but not one negro coming on board i went on shore and after having stayed a while on the strand some negroes came to me and being desirous to be informed why they did not come on board i was answered that about two months before the english had been there with two large vessels and had ravaged the country destroyed all their canoes plundered their houses and carried off some of their people upon which the remainder fled to the inland country where most of them were at that time so that there being not much to be done by us we were obliged to return on board when i inquired after their wars with other countries they told me they were not often troubled with them but if any difference happened they chose rather to end the dispute amicably than to come to arms so you see that he found the inhabitants civil and good-natured so you see that all the lies about the negroes being barbaric are something the the europeans and arabs mostly the christians and muslims concocted they are not true you can see that they were the same people carrying out the raids they were the barbaric people but they turned it around on its head to say it was the negroes now think about it in today's world, are they not still the same people carrying out the terrorism you hear about between both religions? So how do you believe that the people that they have been subjugating since the beginning of time are the same people that are barbaric? So this is what we wanted to show you so that you stop seeing them as telling you anything true. You, the onus is on you to look at these materials yourself and try to study them and get the meanings of what was written down by that time they are for your own good so let us move forward and round up with one or two little tiny things to talk about that should be why this ignorant lady is thanking god for the slave trade so from the same encyclopedia britannica we see that they had no real understanding of what god was like so we see that at that time, the same people that claim to have brought you God or whatever they say it is, represent God as Jupiter. So if you notice, it says God is one of the many names of the supreme being. See Christianity, metaphysics, moral philosophy and theology. God is also used in speaking of the false deities of the heathens, many of which were only creatures to which divine honors and worship were superstitiously paid so you see further down it tells us that thus the omnipotence of god came to be represented under the person and appellation of jupiter the wisdom of god under that of Minerva, the justice of god under that of juno the first idols or false gods that are said to have been adored were the stars sun moon etc on account of the light heat and other benefits which we derive from them Afterwards, the earth came to be deified for furnishing fruits necessary for the subsistence of men and animals. Then fire and water became objects of divine worship for their usefulness to human life. In process of time and by degrees, gods became multiplied to infinity and there was scarce anything but the weakness of or caprice of some devotee or other elevated into the rank of deity. Things useless or even destructive not accepted so you see what the encyclopedia britannica at that time told us about god in subsequent editions we shall show you the negro's concept of god recorded by them and you see which one makes more sense and who was actually 
worshipping the almighty creator of heaven and earth and who was the hidden or idol worshipper or pagan as alleged or claimed by the Muslims and Christians for which they conducted the slave trade and slave raids. So let us move forward in a slightly different direction at the moment. Remember that we referenced this book earlier but we want you to have or take a note of this account and it says one poor wretch who is here has his back terribly lacerated and has suffered badly. We have a girl about Chitenji's size who was to be sold to a white man but who ran off before the bargain could be made. She won't be an easy piece to manage unless she comes under the power of the gospel. So now we want you to note this because if the gospel was not to enslave you, there is no way a slave running away, the antidote would have been to bring her under the power of the gospel. You have to take note of this. It is important you use your brain. That's why the almighty creator gave you that brain. That's why you have to use your brain to understand what the religion you are practicing is supposedly doing to you. So you note this for the subsequent edition so that we understand that this lady celebrating or thanking God for Christianity is normal. It's something expected of her. It is why she was made a Christian. It is simply classical conditioning. She has been mentally in yoked. That is why she is thanking God for the condition that she is in because she can't even quantify what good she has ever done for humanity. The people are still being killed back in Sub-Saharan Africa by the same people that raided and captured them as slaves. The slave raiding army, which is now the national armies of those countries, are still alive and well. So you understand what they are doing. We take one more little narrative of why they give you the religion so that you understand what we're saying in a different form so that you also understand why the lady is so thankful to god for the slavery because she has no idea what slavery is all about so on a final note uh, because we have run out of time you see where he tells us here that his second reason is because he is a christian every slaveholder knows perfectly well that a christian slave is worth much more than one who has no faith at all Many of them are sagacious enough to teach their slaves the gospel and particularly those words of the Apostle Paul, servants be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling Ephesians 6 5. Here and there a slaveholder will forbid his slave to attend religious exercises but he is a fool and he will surely suffer for it. I happened once to get acquainted with a Frenchman an owner of slaves who said to me, Doctor, I will be obliged to you if you will teach my slaves your religious opinions. For though they are to me ridiculous, I know very well that my slaves, once believing in your nonsense, will be worth more to me than they are now. We hope we have been able to enlighten you. We hope also that we have been able to challenge you. We hope also that we have been able to provide you with some thought-provoking topics you can research on. If you have never had time to look at the history of whatever you practice, whatever you worship, beyond the time you were you are acquainted with it, now is the time to do so. Now you have a bit of understanding of why the lady is thanking God for the slave trade. As brutal as it was, as horrendous as it was, she is bold to thank God for it. It is not because she knows what she is doing. It is because the religion is like an opium. She is drunk in that opium. Remember Karl Marx said religion is the opium of the masses. It is that opium that is driving her, coupled with her ignorance of what actually the slave trade was like. She does not know how much her forebears suffered to get there. She does not know how much they suffered to feed her she does not know how much they suffered in the plantations because she has now been given this religion which you can see why they provide it here we have given you two instances the onus is now on you to look for the materials look for other materials and read them very well so that you understand what they are doing with you we thank you very much for listening and we do challenge you to conduct your own research once again thank you very much for listening Peace.